Would you please turn in your Bible to John chapter 15 and verse 1? John chapter 15, verse 1. When you find that portion of God's word, I invite you to stand and read with me silently while I read aloud verses 1 through 5. John chapter 15, beginning with verse 1, the Lord Jesus Christ said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. Won't you please be seated. You might notice that in verse 5, we have the second occasion in mere moments that our Lord Jesus Christ indicated to the remaining 11 apostles that he is the vine. Thus, his identity as the vine must be recognized as extremely important in its implications. Why would he say it twice in the span of three or four seconds? However, you might notice that his statement in verse 1 is a bit different in orientation than the statement here in verse 5, which is my text for this message from God's Word. When he said, I am the true vine, he immediately related what he was saying to his heavenly Father. And my Father is the husbandman. However, in verse 5 he says, I am the vine, but relates what he is to the eleven, and ye are the branches. Thus the Savior is relating the vine imagery to two kinds of relations he has. His relationship with the Father and his relationship with his remaining apostles. One aspect of his role as the true vine is vertical, with the other aspect of his role as the vine being horizontal. Does it come to your mind as it came to my mind that the Ten Commandments also feature vertical versus horizontal implications? The first four commands relate to God and are vertical in their orientation. The final six commands relate to other human beings the first being your parents and are horizontal in their orientation. Observe that the only connection between the Father and the disciples pointed to in this John chapter 15 verses 1 through 17 imagery, the only connection is the Lord Jesus Christ, the vine. He is the mediator between God and men. Has it ever occurred to you that apart from your relationship with Jesus Christ, you have no relationship with God? None. Many unsafe people imagine they have a relationship with God. And they think, well, I talk to God, therefore I have a relationship. Do you have any idea whether he's listening or not, whether he's paying any attention to you or not? So many unsaved people think they ever have a relationship with God, imagine they have a relationship with God, hope they have a relationship with God, but they do not. When I use the word relationship, I refer to a connection based upon blood marriage or kinship. That is how relationship is defined by Webster. Using that understanding of relationship, I think we can agree that no one 
No one has what might be termed a relationship with God except through the Lord Jesus Christ. With that in mind, let me read the first statement in verse 5 once more. The Lord Jesus Christ saying to those men, I am the vine, ye are the branches. What is obvious but sometimes overlooked in our consideration of the Christian life is that this imagery of the Savior being the vine and the disciples being branches is almost, it is an almost explicit declaration that in certain respects the believer in Jesus Christ is an appendage. Ever thought of that before? After all, using this imagery of the vine and the branches, a branch is a living appendage of the vine that has no serviceable function apart from its vital and life-giving connection to the vine. If you separate the branch from the vine, you have only a stick that serves no function but as fuel to burn. Ever think of yourself, a lost person, ever think of yourself as being little more than fuel to burn? That's kind of sobering. If you're lost, you are comparable to imagery in John chapter 15, and that to which you are compared is of no use but as fuel to burn. Whoa! Whoa! <laughs> However, while it is organically connected to the vine, the branch brings forth a great deal of fruit. The Lord's elaboration of his initial remark is found in the final portion of verse 5. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me it can do nothing. Four observations tied to the four phrases comprising this statement. First, he that abideth in me. This, of course, refers to the disciple fulfilling his personal responsibility as one who is in Christ to discharge his duties, obligations, and responsibilities as a disciple. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That's the description of a disciple from the mouth of the Savior himself. Abiding in Christ means there is more to your Christian life than form, though spiritual reality will accompany the outward form. Abiding in Christ includes the cultivation of one's personal relationship with his Savior, learning of him, serving him, cultivating gratitude and appreciation toward him, and exalting him in word and in deed. Here we have the beginning also of a first-class conditional statement that follows the pattern of if so-and-so, then such-and-such, with the first part called the protasis routinely assumed to being a true condition. The presumption here is that the disciple of Christ, a branch in this allegory, the presumption is the disciple of Christ will abide in Christ. That's the presumption. Next comes the phrase, and I in him. Can we rest assured that the Savior will faithfully discharge his duties and his obligations, that he will do his job? I, I think so. <laughs> He's faithful, is he not? Sometimes we're neglectful of Christ's faithfulness to abide in us because his abiding is not perceived by the five senses but is comprehended and is appreciated by us as we feast on the word. Therefore, when a believer does not nourish himself, does not nourish herself by feeding on God's word, he or she becomes quite dulled 
to the reality of Christ abiding in him or abiding in her. These two phrases together comprise the complete first part of the first class conditional statement that takes the form, if this is true and it is assumed to be true with a first class conditional statement, if this be true, then this will follow. Third, the phrase that reads, the same bringeth forth much fruit, that which will follow. Because it is assumed that the disciple will abide in Christ and, and, and the Savior will do his part, the abiding disciple will bring forth much fruit. This is the back portion of the first class conditional statement that I alluded to earlier. I did more than allude to, I mentioned earlier. This is the anticipated and the expected conclusion. Now, how can we be sure? They say, Pastor, how do we know this is going to happen? Well, the Lord said so. You can bank on it. Amen? And he is, after all, faithful and true. Amen? What if you are not bearing fruit? There are only two possibilities, since there can be no doubt that Christ faithfully abides in every believer. The Savior always does his part. So if you're not bearing fruit, either the professing Christian is not truly born again, or the believer's responsibilities to abide in Christ are not being properly and intentionally discharged at that time in his or her life. If you abide in Christ, since Christ will abide in you, you will bear fruit. And finally, we read, for without me, you can do nothing. Our Lord speaks here to his apostles, remember, he has an audience of 11 men. There's nobody else around. Even they can become so caught up in busyness and mundane things that they forget to abide in Christ even though they are still in Christ. Is it possible for someone who is in Christ to not abide in Christ? For a while anyway, yes, it is possible. So, so too, you and I, it is not me, but thee, O Lord. It is always, always, always him. Amen? So with these truths fresh in our minds, I want to emphasize two realities for you to take home with you this morning. Two realities that are crucial to the thinking and growth in Christ of every child of God. First, Consider your spiritual situation positively. Again, he that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. We understand the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking to his 11 remaining apostles after leaving the upper room following their celebration of the Passover, the institution of the communion of the Lord's Supper, and Judas Iscariot's departure to complete his arrangements to betray the Savior for 30 pieces of silver. The Lord Jesus Christ is now preparing those men for life following the crucifixion, life following the resurrection, and life after giving to them the indwelling of the Spirit of God. Their responsibility as Christ's disciples will be very simple and straightforward. I didn't say easy. I said simple. I didn't say easy. I said straightforward. Abide in him. Abide in him. Of course, he will abide in them. The result of this mutually beneficial relationship will be the production in their lives of much fruit. By way of application, allow me to make use of our Savior's comments to those men for our contemporary benefit. I, I believe that three comments are in order. First, the promise of much fruit. 
No one doubts that our Lord's reference in this imagery to much fruit was a promise of spiritual blessing. He was creating a picture in the minds of his men that would convey a spiritual imagery they would remember for the rest of their lives. I very strongly considered this morning sending my wife on an errand to the grocery store so that she could get several clusters of grapes. And then I thought about the logistics of getting Ken Barbosa and Everett Moyer and several other guys to put on rubber gloves so that they could walk around handing out grapes to everyone so that it would impress upon you for the rest of your lives. Oh, you remember that Sunday morning when pastor passed out grapes? And then, of course, in years to come, there would be a whole bunch of people who remembered being there who weren't here this morning. And then the logistics of that had decided to pass on it and just kind of created in your mind, oh, you remember that day that pastor thought about handing out grapes to us? <laughs> in like manner to them remembering for the rest of their lives this mental imagery he gave to them, let us be careful in arriving at an understanding of what this verse means to understand that it can have only one meaning. You understand that, right? Any verse of Scripture can have only one meaning with many applications of that principle or of that truth or of that meaning. The meaning of this verse has only to do with those 11 men on that evening, at that time, on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. That's the only meaning it can have. For the last 2,000 years, Bible students have been blessed by studying this and other passages and coming to a correct understanding of its meaning and then being careful, being really, really careful to apply the truths of this verse to our life's situations. There can be as many applications of this verse as there are people who study it while there is only one meaning. So if you ever find yourself in a Bible study sitting around a table or sitting on the floor cross-legged and having just finished singing Kumbaya, and somebody with a Bible says, so what, do you, what does this verse mean to you? Stand up and run out of that room like your hair is on fire. It doesn't matter what it means to you. It doesn't matter what it means to me. What matters is what it means. Once we come to an understanding of what it means, then we can make application to our individual lives. Sadly, those of the charismatic Pentecostal movement uh, in the 21st century seem to have absolutely no understanding of that hermeneutical concept. So, <clears throat> our Lord Jesus Christ promised those men much fruit, resulting from them abiding him and he abiding in them. So we would ask, what is the much fruit to be born? I take it to be love for one another, verses 12 and 17. Others take much fruit to refer to a full-bodied Christian personality and spirituality and Christ-likeness, with still others believing that the much fruit here refers to souls that are saved through evangelism and outreach. I would not argue with those views because what I believe to be the proper interpretation and what they might believe to be the proper interpretation actually fits together like a hand in a glove. And it might very well be that a proper understanding of this verse is not an either or, but a both and. Next, the premise of much fruit. Whether the notion of much fruit is apostles loving apostles, apostles being Christ-like, or sinners brought to Christ, I have noticed a tendency to disregard the premise of much fruit. The imagery of the fruit and vine depends upon us understanding that the branch bearing fruit is utterly dependent upon its vital connection to the life-giving vine. Thus, there is no real fruit if there is no real abiding in Christ. That leads us to conclude that whatever is produced 
by any active and energetic individual who, will, who, who despite his religiosity, is not abiding in Christ. Have you ever known some really revved up people in the ministry and they're really hyper and they're really energetic and they do this and do that and do this and do that and do this and do that and they neglect only one thing, abiding in Christ. And what they have done is they have substituted form and ritual for intimacy and obedience to the Savior. What they are producing, because they're always producing something, but what they are producing is something that is not fruit. When he produces what he produces, it may appear to be fruit to those without discernment of any kind. But if you are not abiding in Christ, no matter what is produced by your life, it is categorically not fruit. I, I speak of those who would record the number of baptisms and record the number of decisions and record the number of professions of faith and, and record the number of those in attendance and, and other such measures of success that do not correspond to the bearing of much fruit and have a great tendency of being those numbers. They have a great tendency of being carnal results from carnal means employed by those who are not abiding in Christ. I need only remind some of you of the spiritual condition of a number of 20th century figures I'll not name them, you already know who they are, who built rapidly growing churches, proclaimed numerous conversions and baptisms, were written up about in books, they led the nation in, in, in the growth of Sunday school attendance and enrollment, and, 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 all, and all the while they were engaged in adulterous affairs and embezzlement. If you are cheating and you are stealing, you are not abiding in Christ. Hello? Therefore, whatever it is you are producing cannot possibly be rightly considered much fruit. It is something, but it is not much fruit. Third, the perversion of much fruit. The whole notion of bearing much fruit began to be perverted within the ranks of American Christianity during the 19th century ministry of a guy named Charles G. Finney, whose Pelagian theology resulted in him introducing to evangelism the notion that techniques and persuasion were more important to evangelism than abiding in Christ. Finney's influence grew in the 20th century with Billy Sunday and Billy Graham. His influence was so penetrating that personal evangelism courses being taught to both church members and Bible college students preparing for the ministry focused more on personal hygiene, persuasion skills, the use of peer pressure, and an absolute commitment to the invitation system at the conclusion of the preaching service than the evangelist's personal consecration to God and walk with Christ. The Benaka blast was more important than your prayer life. Being able to get people to bow their heads, close their eyes, and repeat words were more important than your understanding of what happened when a sinner turned to Christ. Though the Savior never dealt with any two sinners in the same way, and there is no evidence that his apostles were any different in ministering the gospel to individuals as individuals, such is not the case in our day, is it? Throughout the 20th century, it was assumed, presumed might be a better word, that real evangelism required the use of a gospel tract, mandated an instant decision by the sinner, and assumed that prayer was not only the necessary means to trust Christ, 
but that someone who bowed his head, closed his eyes, and repeated the soul winner's words was taken to be a new creature in Christ, not subject to any scrutiny or additional consideration. If bearing much fruit can be reduced to a matter of mechanics and techniques, even if you remove the technique of the invitation system and replace it with another technique of some kind, then you have removed the requirement for abiding in Christ in order to produce much fruit. The reality when that is done, of course, is that what is produced is not much fruit at all. Much fruit is produced only in the lives of those who abide in Christ. Would you like to see sinners come to Christ? Can't imagine anyone here not wanting that to happen. Do you have an interest in seeing a loved one converted to Christ? I can't imagine anyone not wanting to see a loved one come to Christ. Do you imagine seeing that realized and not being related to you abiding in Christ? Recognize as well that although a believer can faithfully attend church, can be discipled, and can read the Bible, pray, and give to the cause of Christ while not actually abiding in Christ at all. The reverse is not true. Those who abide in Christ live a certain way and do prescribe things that are pleasing to God. Those who do not abide in Christ sometimes imitate that kind of conduct without any corresponding reverence for God or desire to exalt the Savior. You say, well, what is that? It's called counterfeit. You've heard of counterfeit money? Long before there was counterfeit money, there was counterfeit Christianity. Next, consider your spiritual situation negatively. The Savior said, for without me, ye can do nothing. Remember, the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking to his remaining apostles. What the Lord Jesus Christ says here has direct application to Christians of our day and indirect application to unsaved people of our day. Well, if Christians who are not abiding in Christ can do nothing, well, pfft, do unsaved people honestly believe they can accomplish anything in their lives? You say, well, you can be successful in business. What does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? If you're an unsafe person, you cannot be a successful human being. You cannot be a successful husband or wife. You cannot be a successful mother or father. You cannot be a successful grandmother or grandfather. You can make a lot of money as a businessman, but you're a failure in life. Two days ago, I participated in a Zoom call with 35 Baptist pastors scattered around the state of California. It was a conference call initiated by several good men who are concerned about the pandemic lockdown and the prohibition by the governor of California against congregations gathering for indoor worship. Their idea is for pastors to rendezvous on the steps of the state capitol in Sacramento to conduct a public prayer meeting to call upon the governor of California to end the lockdown and to speak to our legislators to express our concerns about the abridgment of our First Amendment guarantees of freedom of speech and the free exercise of religion. They actually think that the First Amendment is black and white, all or nothing. No amendment is black and white or all or nothing, is it? No. No. No one has the absolute right of anything. I don't care what the Constitution says. That's, that's the way law is in the United States. These are well-intentioned men. 
But I fear they are oblivious to the intentions of our state's elected leaders. Unless you have attended a secular university and interacted with those idealists who have spent years preparing themselves for what they are now doing, you have no idea what they really believe. You have no idea what their real agenda. You have no idea how they define success. May I shock and surprise you? The mayor of Portland is a very happy guy. He said, well, his city is burning down, and, and they, came to his, his, they came to his residence. Okay. But do you realize that he is now fulfilling a dream that he has had for 30-plus years? He dreamed of this when he was in college. He has been working toward this happening in his city from that time. He is delighted with what's happening in Portland. The mayor of Seattle is thrilled with what's happening in Seattle. Uh, Eric Garcetti is delighted with what's happening in Los Angeles. Governor Newsom is pleased that he is wreaking havoc on the state. This is their goal. I understand because I remember from back in the day that those longtime members of La Raza and Mecha are committed to the ruination of the state of California. They've been planning it since they were freshmen in college. They envision California being returned to Mexico where they believe California rightly belongs, and not just California, also Texas and Arizona and New Mexico and Colorado and Utah. Do you doubt they will transform California into Tijuana to get their way? <laughs> That's what's happening. They want California to become TJ. Those leaders in Sacramento who are not in agreement with many of our state's Latino leaders are themselves communists who would be happy to see California burned to the ground. They support Black Lives Matter and Antifa with the leadership of those groups being admitted communists who are committed to the overthrow of our way of life and the demise of our form of government and the replacement of our economy of capitalism with socialism. They adore Fidel Castro. Oh, they thought Hugo Chavez was, was, was the bee's knees. Wonderful and well-intentioned pastors who assume something about California's leaders that amounts to little more than a projection of their goals and desires to them without an understanding of Sacramento's politicians' goals and desires are doomed to failure. What is needed is clarity and understanding with the realization that clarity and understanding is no guarantee of success. Do you not think Daniel knew exactly what was going on in Babylon? Yet he was still a slave. D do you not think Joseph didn't know exactly what was happening in Egypt? Yet he was still a slave. So knowing what's going on may help you to cope better, but it doesn't mean your side's going to win. Back to our text. I'm talking about politically now. I'm not talking about spiritually. We already have the victory in Christ. Back to our text. Our goal, as it ought to be for every Christian, is clarity and understanding. And clarity and understanding of this phrase. For without me ye can do nothing. Many professing Christians read this phrase hear this phrase read and explained, and yet they are not impacted by what the Savior meant when he said these words. So let us strive for clarity and understanding. First, let me address the confusion. So many Christians do what is easy to do, which is to seek to bear fruit without paying attention to the context in which this statement is made. The Lord Jesus Christ was speaking to his men 
who were already believers in Jesus Christ, who were both determined and dedicated to discovering his will for their lives and then obeying it. This first means nothing to you unless you are already there. It was to such men that the Lord warned that without him they could do nothing. The believer in Jesus Christ who is committed to Jesus Christ, who is seeking Christ's will for his life, who is determined to obey and exalt the Savior is nevertheless. It is that person who is warned about the futility of attempting to bear fruit without Christ. Now, does that not suggest to you, as it must have suggested to those apostles, how easy it is for a believer in Jesus Christ who is committed to Jesus Christ, who seeks to discover and obey the will of the Savior, who genuinely desires to abide in Christ, but who still risks seeking to bear fruit without Christ? Let us not be confused unless we are both conscientiously and consciously striving to abide in Christ, our efforts to bear fruit will be in vain. Would you like to know what this Greek word translated nothing means? Udes is used as both an adjective and a noun in the Greek New Testament. When used as an adjective, the word means no. When used as a noun, the word means no one, nobody, nothing. Thus, the word means zilch, zip, zero, nada, nothing. Has the Savior made his point? To those paying attention, yes, he has. Next, let me address the consecration. What makes it difficult for many Christians to grasp the implications of what the Lord Jesus Christ says here is confusion in their mind regarding this matter of consecration. This will be what I label a profound statement, so pay attention for just the next couple of minutes. There is so much of self in the mind and heart of the contemporary Christian with so little room for a consideration of Christ. We read Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me, but so often we merge Paul's statement with the humanistic philosophy of the power of positive thinking to think that what is meant is the ability to do anything I want to do. That is not what the Apostle Paul meant by his statement, and it bears no resemblance to what the Lord Jesus Christ said in our text. Consider what the Apostle Paul earlier wrote to the Romans in Romans chapter 5, verse 6. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Without strength translates the Greek word asthenes, meaning helpless in a moral sense. Then in Romans chapter 6 and verse 9, we read, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. Surprise, surprise, infirmity in this verse translates asthenia. The point that I seek to make is that as a person is weak and incapable of spiritual function before conversion, so is that same individual incapable of any spiritual function after conversion. Despite the believer's best efforts to serve God, God, to live for God and produce spiritual fruit, it is not going to happen if he does not abide in Christ. It must be understood that consecration, which has to do with one's commitment to abiding in Christ and cultivating your relationship with Christ over time, absolutely will not result in the improvement of your spiritual ability to bear fruit. You and I will never be given the spiritual ability to bear fruit. Sanctification, the process of growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, does not result in any Christian developing or cultivating his ability to bear fruit. It is one thing to know the Lord Jesus Christ better 
and to love him more, which happens with Christian growth and maturity and is a good thing. It is another thing to acquire the skill, to acquire the means, the techniques needed to bear spiritual fruit. That will never happen. Bearing fruit is always and ever and only the consequence of abiding in Christ and it is never, ever the consequence of honing one's skills. Leadership skills, speaking skills, spiritual skills, whatever kind of skills you want to think of. And I conclude with the consummation. When I refer to the consummation, I'm talking about going to heaven, to standing before the Savior in a glorified body to see and be seen by him. The Christian life begins with regeneration and the sinner trusting Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of his sins. The Christian is justified by faith in Christ and at that moment is indwelt by the Spirit of God. The process is also begun called sanctification. If justification immediately and forever alters your status before God, sanctification is the beginning of a lifelong process of growth and gradual transformation. We know that it will not end until we are in heaven because of what Paul declared in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. We all, and also because of what he wrote in Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Thus, every born-again Christian will someday be in heaven. And as we travel through the Christian life, we will grow in grace and in the knowledge of God. We will become more Christ-like. That said, what we will never be able to accomplish by experience or maturity or cleverness or programs or, ma or manipulation or persuasion is fruitful, fruitfulness. No, to bear fruit at any point during the course of life, we must abide in Christ. If you do not abide in Christ at any point along the way, you will not bear fruit. You may build a large church. You may obtain many professions of faith. You may see lots of decisions, but you will not see actual fruit apart from abiding in Christ. Now, most of what we see in the Christian realm around us that impresses us is the result of superior skills. Marketing, persuasion, brilliance, organizational ability, and such as that. But for your daddy to be saved, for your son or daughter to come to Christ, and for your friend or neighbor to trust Christ will absolutely require that you abide in Christ. Perhaps much fruit means soul saved. Perhaps much fruit means Christians loving one another. Perhaps much fruit means greater Christ likeness. Whatever it is, and it could be a combination of all three, whatever it is, the reality of Christ's life being lived through you will only happen if you consciously and conscientiously abide in Christ. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your goodness, for the word of God, for clarity in Scripture. Help us that we might understand Help us that we might reflect. Help us not that we might feel guilt-ridden and downtrodden and in any way um, chagrined despite the fact that we have these wonderful blessings and this great victory in Christ. Help us rather 
to grow in wisdom, to grow in knowledge, to grow in understanding, to know where to place the next step in our Christian life along this pathway that leads us to where we need to be. We thank you that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway, and we pray that we might be much encouraged by the truth of the word of God, that we might be ready and eager to be informed, to be corrected, to be challenged, to be encouraged, to be strengthened, to be clarified. And for these things, we thank you. And for those who are unsaved, Father, I pray that you might bring to them a moment of clarity, that they might recognize that their life is utterly and completely meaningless despite activity without Christ, that they simply need the Savior and nothing else will do. Blessed to that end, and we will thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Eisenberger comes at this time. Please turn in your hymnal to hymn number 320 as he leads us in a final verse.